Anthony Alonso. That was uh, three goals in 15 minutes to make it three apiece, and that's the way it's stayed since then. With 11 minutes to go, we could be heading for extra time, and one imagines that uh, with uh, tens of thousands of Liverpool fans watching the game on Merseyside itself, those who didn't get over to Istanbul, uh, Sky's Paul Harrison is with them, and uh, one imagines, Paul, that the uh, atmosphere is somewhat different over the last half hour or so. Yeah, absolutely. This is the uh, Argos Pub at Anfield. I'll give you a, a quick swing round of the camera just to see the faces that once were glum uh, and now are no longer glum. Basically, uh, you know, when Gerard uh, put it in the back of the net about seven minutes into the second half, the whole pub transformed from being pretty miserable, as you might imagine, to uh, now, you know, waiting with bated breath that they might actually uh, get the victory. Let's have a chat with Steve, he's with me. Um, Steve, you were pretty unfortunate enough to talk to me at the end of the first half. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a pretty different story now. Uh, yeah, I, I thought, you know, get a bit of pride back in the first half. I thought, 3-0, the game's over. Get a bit of pride back. People were having a go at the team and that. Oh, it was unbelievable. Really unbelievable. Got one back. And it's just been phenomenal. But no, I can't, I can't, I can, you know, explain what it feels to me and my friends. We spent a few lads over there. Travelled up from Wembley this morning. Lads with Liverpool supporters, one's in the car to go home tonight. That is what Liverpool football club means to so many supporters. One, one, one lad was saying to me how he was preparing to commiserate the night. Uh, uh, how are you going to party through? Well, you know, we'll see what happens at the end of the night, but I mean, if we even get beat, it's, you know, we've, we've done so well tonight, we've done really so well. I had text messages at half time going, I'm drowning me sorrows, drowning me sorrows. And the, the team have been fantastic. Fantastic. I can't, you know, can't explain it. You know, you can see on here the pub, what, what it means to people, and it's been unbelievable. You know, you couldn't have dreamt for a better night. I mean, my voice is nearly gone. I just, I, I, I'm really enjoying myself. Fantastic. Okay, Steve. Thank you very much. We'll let you get back to the last. Cheers. What is it? Uh, just about eight minutes now of normal time. If they do it, if it's 4-3, it could be one of the biggest and most greatest comebacks that this tournament's ever seen. No question about that, Paul. It will emphatically be, but uh, it's uh, still 3-3 at the moment. Thanks very much for the moment, Paul. Now, the other big uh, football story of the day, Martin O'Neill is to leave Celtic after Saturday's Scottish Cup final against Dundee United. He's standing down to look after his ill wife. O'Neill had been at Parkhead for five years, winning three SPL titles. The man who's taking over in June is Gordon Strachan. In five years, five years have at times flown in, and at other times they have been the longest five years of my life. But uh, overall, uh, great, great memories of football. So fantastic. How, how stressful has it been, Martin, recently, trying to run this club and all the demands that go with it, and not sure your wife as well? Well, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. The board have been incredibly supportive. You know, uh, um, we had some good news uh, last year and uh, not so good news this year and uh, they've been very, very supportive. Too. Well, Strachan has been given a 12-month rolling contract. He's been out of management since leaving Southampton last year. He was also manager at Coventry for nearly five years but left after they were relegated. Manchester United owner Malcolm Glazer is under investigation by the NFL. The American, seen here at an NFL convention in Washington, also owns the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He's been asked by the NFL to explain moves to build a Las Vegas-style casino and hotel complex at Old Trafford. The NFL clubs are worried these plans will contravene their strict policies on gambling. But on a positive note for Glazer, Tampa Bay have been voted as the venue for the Super Bowl showdown in 2009. Tim Henman's been knocked out in the second round of the French Open. The seventh seed was unable to repeat his achievements of last season when he reached the semi-finals in Paris. There were some good moments for Tim Henman against Louise Horner, but not enough. After losing the first set, he produced his best tennis in a tie-break for the second. Oh, that's stunning. As he closed out to level the match against his less experienced opponent, it looked promising. Excellent tie-break from Henman. But it was a false dawn. He was making too many errors and his serve was broken early in the third set. And it wasn't only Henman's game that was in question, but his temperament as well. He was warned by the umpire for swearing, 
though he later complained that non-English speakers get away with it all the time. The seventh seed were struggling to take points off Horner serve and the Peruvian eased into a 2-1 lead. Hopes of a Henman comeback never materialised. He was broken again by the world number 59, who'd never before reached the third round of a Grand Slam. And another mistake from the British number one sealed his fate. And Horner, who finished the match limping, now faces Romania's Victor Henescu, a missed opportunity for Henman. John Driscoll, Sky News. Number four seed Rafael Nadal had a straightforward win over Xavier Malice, winning 6-2, 6-2, 6-4. World number one, Roger Federer also into the third round. He beat Nicolas Amagro of Spain in three sets. Defending champion Gaston Gaudio made it to round three without hitting a ball. His opponent Dmitry Tursunov withdrawing with a knee injury. And uh, Kim Kleisters is through to the third round with a straight sets win over Ludmila Chervanova of Slovakia. Glamorgan pace bowler Simon Jones has recovered from his back injury and will play in tomorrow's first test against Bangladesh at Lords. Jones gets the nod ahead of the uncapped Gloucestershire seamer John Lewis. Uh, significantly, England captain Michael Vaughan moves up to number three in the batting order and uh, will play uh, opposite his uh, Australian counterpart Ricky Ponting. Gareth Batty replaces the injured Ashley Giles as the spinner in the side. His hip problem has failed to respond to treatment in time, but Ashley Giles hopes to be fit for the second test match in Durham next week. Yeah, it is a blow. He's, um, he's had a great year with the England team and he's had a good start with Warwickshire, so we will miss him. Um, you know, it's unfortunate on his behalf, but you know, it creates an opportunity for Gareth Batty to come in and show us you know, what he could do. He, we carried around the whole of South Africa without giving him a game and you know, he's got his chance to play at Lords in a test match, so we wish him well. The ECB say speculation Ashley Giles will need surgery is wide of the mark. England have resisted the temptation to go in with an all-seam attack. With only one test match behind him, Ian Bell, selected ahead of Kevin Peterson and Robert Key, won't be exposed at first wicket down. I'm going to go to three and um, Ian's going to bat at four, which is a nice position to bat when you're just coming into the team. And He's played one test match. Uh, I've played a number and I think the experience factor of having me at three will you know, probably bring a little bit more to the side. Belly's a fine prospect, as he showed in his game last year. And, you know, we wish him well. And we expect a lot of runs for him because he looks a fine player. They may be facing the whipping boys of Test cricket, but England are approaching this as if they're playing the Aussies. You know, the England team over the last 18 months have had a few hurdles put in front of them, and they've certainly overcome them. And this is another one where people are expected us to win. Uh, it's a potential banana skin. You know, we expect to win ourselves, which is the most important thing, and we expect to win well. And if we play the cricket that like we did in the winter and last year, we'll put Bangladesh under a lot of pressure. So without Ashley Giles, England are all set for their first test match of this summer. Always a special occasion here at the home of cricket, no matter what the opposition. Tim Abraham, Sky News. And just a reminder that Sir Liverpool have fought back from 3-0 down in the Champions League final to 3-all. Uh, just a few minutes to go. We'll uh, bring you the very latest in uh, a couple of minutes' time. It could be going into extra time if it stays that way. Well, in fact, it definitely will be if it stays that way at the Ataturk Stadium. Well, that's it for the moment from me. Now here's Steph with a check on the weather for you. As this area of high pressure moves in from the west, the temperature will rise to 28, 29 Celsius by midday. So make sure you cream up well. If you want to know more, I'll be sitting here. Thompson.co.uk sponsors Sky News Weather. Hello there. Well, we've seen some torrential downpours over Britain and Ireland today, but elsewhere, some parts have been seeing quite a lot of sunshine. You can see the cloud on the satellite picture here breaking up over parts of England and Wales, and it's here where we've seen the best of the sunshine. And some places even saw temperatures up at 22 degrees. That's 72 Fahrenheit, and it really did feel very nice in that sunshine. Elsewhere, though, well, it was a different picture altogether. All of this cloud gave an awful lot of rain. It's still doing so, and only slowly is it working its way southwards. It is gradually beginning to move away, though, from Scotland and Ireland, and I think here, by first thing on Thursday, it should be fine and dry. Temperatures, well, they won't get below 8 or 9, but it will feel a little bit cooler than that, thanks to rather a stern breeze. That wind is also going to bring just one or two showers to western parts of Ireland, and perhaps one or two sneaking into the north of Ireland as well. 
elsewhere across Scotland and Ireland, though, it's going to be a fine day with plenty of sunshine. That belt of rain, though, by lunchtime tomorrow, look at it, barely any rain on it at all, just a little bit of cloud and patchy drizzle at times. That's over central England. But for the southeast, I don't think the rain or the cloud will get there. It might be a bit of a murky start, but that should begin to break up later in the day. And if you see some sunshine, temperatures will rocket up to 23 degrees. That's a 73 Fahrenheit. And even if you don't see that sunshine, it's still going to feel really quite muggy. Still going to stay unsettled for the next few days, though. On Friday, well, with a low pressure just to the southwest of us, we're going to see plenty of rain working its way northwards, and it's going to be quite breezy as well. That low pressure then makes its way across the Irish Sea on Saturday, still with lots of wet weather associated with it, and plenty of showers as well. Eventually, that low pressure should move away, though. And on Sunday, things are looking far calmer, perhaps still just a little bit of wet weather clinging on to the southeast before eventually even that moves away. And then I think for most of Britain and Ireland, it should be a fine day with plenty of sunshine and in the sunshine not feeling bad 18 or 19 degrees across Europe well things have been brilliant today and they're looking pretty good tomorrow as well with very little showers to dodge at all They're into injury time at the end of normal time in the Champions League final. Just to update you, Liverpool came back from 3-0 down against AC Milan to level it at three apiece. There's two minutes of injury time being played. And uh, if it stays at 3-all, then we're into extra time, half an hour of that, and then penalties if needs be. At the moment, uh, after that flurry of goals in the first hour, six of them uh, in the first hour, it uh, now looks as if uh, something of a, a stalemate, stalemate has developed, but uh, as you can see, uh, Liverpool supporters watching on Merseyside, uh, a much happier bunch now. Paul Harrison, who uh, has been uh, spending the evening with them, joins us now. And Paul, uh, uh, what's the mood there like now? Um, well, pretty good. I think, uh, I think all these fans here are, are just utterly relieved that, that they uh, are going to get to see extra time at the end of the first half. I think they pretty much uh, thought it was all over. Uh, that is virtually um, com completely the opposite now. They really think that they can win it. Uh, one uh, chap I spoke to at half-time, uh, he said, you know, we've been ruled out of all of our games so far. We've always been the underdog and we've always come back. Uh, and now that the uh, half-time whistle's blown, they'll be uh, pretty much going into half-time thinking that we can do this. OK, Paul, well, uh, I can tell you the uh, full-time whistle has now blown and there's some Italians uh, looking pretty uh, dejected on the bench, having tossed away a 3-0 lead and they will really feel that uh, they've uh, blown their... Uh, absolutely golden opportunity of uh, winning this match. Liverpool back from the dead three apiece and now we go into uh, half an hour of extra time and one would think Paul that uh, the momentum would be with Liverpool they've made a couple of changes uh, but uh, the momentum would seem to be with them now wouldn't it? Yeah that's right well Cizé is on now he, uh, he had a pretty forging run across the right wing towards the end of that uh, uh, match and uh, you know he really showed uh, utter determination he's on the pitch to give the team an extra boost. We saw at half-time uh, uh, Benitez pull off a defender, bring on Didier Hamann in the midfield, just to pretty much redress the balance, perhaps in the first half Liverpool being a bit defensive and not taking it to Milan. The danger, of course, always is you start doing that and that opens up some gaps in defence uh, and Milan might be able to sneak uh, and breach their defence and come back and score the winner. But uh, they, 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 they've done it so far, they've got to extra time. Uh, they're looking for the one goal that'll take them to uh, win their first European trophy for uh, 21 years. Indeed, Paul, thank you, yes. And uh, just worth reminding us that um, these Italians, AC Milan, gave away a 3-1 lead just, uh, just under a week ago in uh, Serie A, the Italian Championship. They were 3-1 up against Palermo and drew 3 all. So this defence is porous, as we've seen before and have seen emphatically tonight. So it's three apiece in Istanbul. We're into extra time in the next couple of minutes. Its armoury is formidable. It's been described as the most significant fighting machine to enter the British Army since the tank. The Apache AH Mark I attack helicopter has just been declared fully operational after two weeks of testing under battlefield conditions. Sky's defence correspondent Jeff Mead reports. 
From today, Britain can field a weapon as intimidating as it is potent. The Apache helicopter gunship enters service as the main strike force of the Army's High Readiness 16 Air Assault Brigade. Five years since the latest variant of the American-designed aircraft began assembly at Yeovil in Somerset, they go into action nearby. In a massive exercise codenamed Eagle Strike, the first of these 30 million pound flying tanks tipped the balance in a war game across Salisbury Plain. All 16 got airborne, uh, flew ahead of the, uh, of the assault uh, force. They went in to neutralize and identify those targets using the significant sort of uh, technical package they have on board. The Apache program, unlike so many other military contracts that strayed over budget or left soldiers short of essential kit, managed to hit its two billion pound price tag with all the accuracy of the armament it carries. They can speed into combat at up to 160 miles an hour and then dominate a large battlefield. They've got electronic sensors that can detect scores of targets miles away and then a range of weapons to destroy them at will. The psychological impact of this predatory warbird is of value too. Commanders say its reputation is so fearsome it could deter an enemy from even attacking in the first place. Accepted for active service, it may see action in Afghanistan in the coming months. Jeff Mead, Sky News, Merrifield, Somerset. The Queen will lead commemorations to mark the 60th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. She'll address the nation as part of a series of events planned for Sunday, July the 10th. But not everyone is happy about the timing of the commemorations. Some veterans say more should have been done to mark the end of hostilities in Europe back in May. Best of British. Today they created a little reminder of wartime London 60 years ago outside the Cabinet War Offices. An appropriate setting for the Defence Secretary to outline plans for a day of national commemoration to mark the 60th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. In a repeat of the D-Day celebrations, a Lancaster bomber will drop a million poppies down the mall during a flypass by the Battle of Britain flight. And a salvo from HMS Belfast moored on the Thames will mark the start of a period of silence on July the 10th. It's been chosen midway between VE and VJ Day precisely in order that those who fought in Burma and the Far East uh, are not forgotten. But that decision has upset some veterans of the war in the Far East. Britain's celebrations to mark VE Day early in the month were described by some as low-key and off the mark, with neither the Queen nor the Prime Minister attending. Government VE Day commemorations in May were not handled very well. We were given no notice of what was intended, we were not invited. Uh, it was quite a surprise when we heard that Prince Charles was officiating at the ceremony at the Cenotaph. Sixty years ago, while people in London took to the streets celebrating VE Day, the war in the Far East against the Japanese was still being fought fiercely. It wasn't for another three months before the atom bombs were dropped on Japan and the war was finally over on August 15th. Some veterans believe that's the date that should be remembered in this anniversary year. When it was the day people were enjoying here, we were fighting in Burma. And, they, and I lost 35 of my pilots uh, to the Japanese. So the war was still on. It, the war had not ended in VE, not for us. Many of those who fought in the Far East will carry out their own commemoration services in August to mark the day the war really ended for them. Peter Sharp, Sky News. Now, speaking of pictures of Michael Jackson leaving court today, the defence now, of course, have wound up their case. That's Mr Jackson leaving court at the end of the defence's case after trying 60 days for him, obviously. A Hollywood actor told Jordan Singh's accuser was, in his words, an unusually cunning teenager. Latest pictures for you there. Yoshi Sky News. And still to come tonight... Ring ding 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 bomb. Mm, why this man is to blame for what could be the most annoying number one ever. May Sky Box Office, a massive movie lineup, one button. This week, Jude Law is Alfie. 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 Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh my God. In Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow. Renee Zellweger in Bridget Jones 2. And the voices of Jack Black and Robert De Niro in Shark Tale. Son, you're going to learn how to be a shark. Hi. 
and Lemmy. All in one place and all yours. Just push the button. Skybox Office this week. Focus C-Max Compact MPV, now available for May and June with 0% typical APR. Visit your Ford dealer for a test drive. What, you thought it was electronical microchips inside these things? Nah, it's me, Mr. Mouse, working my tail off all day surfing the net. And for what? To trace their ancestors. Look up their school friends. Just for once, let me do something useful, like pay a visit to eshua.com and get a quote. <laughs> Ta-da. Your car, your home, even your holiday, all covered in double-click time. The money you could save with eshua.com could make you one happy bunny. And me, one happy mouse. Eshua.com, insurance at mice's prices. Come on, give us a click. Many Chinese believe the number eight brings prosperity. That's why in Hong Kong, people will pay millions of dollars for a number plate. At HSBC, we also believe that eight can bring you prosperity, because now you can earn 8% on regular savings fixed for a year. 8% on your savings, a great reason to bank with HSBC. When you had diarrhea this morning, you had a choice. Did you hope it might go away by itself? Or did you take Imodium Plus? Why risk upsetting the rest of your day? Take Imodium. Take control. Have you tried Color Expert from L'Oreal? Now voted Hair Color of the Year 2005. It's the first at home color plus highlights in one that's truly multitonal. First, beautiful all over base color goes on. Then you enhance it with harmonized highlights just where you want them. It's like one, two, easy, and it's done. It doesn't dry out your hair, and the wand, this thing is great. It's not the kind of color that you've ever really been able to get on your own before. Get expert multitonal hair color at home. Color Expert from L'Oreal Paris, now voted product of the year. Party in Cannes. Wake up in Saint-Tropez with EasyCruise.com. Sponsors of the Destinations Report. Hello there. Well, across many parts of Europe today, today has seen some terrific weather and tomorrow is looking pretty good as well. Just one or two showers to dodge here and there, but I think generally for many parts of Europe, it will be fine and warm. All the way through France, through Spain and Portugal. So it's Portugal we're going on today's destination report to the south, to Faro. With temperatures at this time of year are normally 22 degrees and you can normally expect 10 hours of sunshine. But for the next few days, that temperatures should be well higher than that and up to 26. Cruise into the playground of the rich and famous with EasyCruise.com You're watching Sky News. Good evening. Top stories this evening. They are playing extra time in an extraordinary Champions League final in Istanbul. Liverpool came back from 3-0 down against AC Milan to level the scores at 3-3-0. That's how it stands at the moment. Extra time continues. Michael Jackson's lawyers have wrapped up their defence case. These pictures to us within the last few minutes of Michael Jackson leaving the court this afternoon. The jury will now hear rebuttals and closing arguments before going to consider their verdict. A man who served 25 years for a crime he didn't leave denied. Don't forget, of course, that you can catch up with your news at any time. Sky.com slash news, our website address. Some other news in brief now. Footballer Rio Ferdinand received a 28-day driving ban after being caught overtaking a police car at 106 miles an hour. He was also fined £1,500. The 26-year-old England defender has been banned from driving before for drink driving and speeding offences. The trial over the storming of Parliament by pro-hunt protesters yes. has heard from a government minister who was in the chamber at the time. Brian Ferris' son Otis is one of eight people charged with causing politicians harassment and alarm. 
Filmmaker Ismail Merchant has died at the age of 88. Seen here on the right with director James Ivory, the pair made a series of acclaimed period films, including Howard's End, A Room with a View, and Remains of the Day. He died in a London hospital this afternoon. Room with a View, one of the great films of all time. I've just come back from Florence, and I thought of it again and again. Howard's End, wonderful. Uh, the Bostonians I loved, an American film he did. You know, they made an enormous contribution. It's strange that these people came from the Indian continent and really popularised some of the loveliest spots of Europe and England. Let's catch up on all sport for you now. Uh, extra time in Istanbul. Charlie has the latest. Indeed, yes. Uh, Liverpool uh, fighting back from 3-0 down against AC Milan in the Champions League final to level it at three apiece. And uh, that's the way it's stayed since uh, the hour mark, uh, at which point Xabi Alonso's penalty had uh, got Liverpool uh, back to parity with AC Milan. They've now, as uh, Paula says, uh, gone into extra time. They've played eight minutes of that. And if it stays that way, they'll be going to the dreaded penalties. But uh, Liverpool would have taken that after the first 45 minutes. Martin O'Neill will leave Celtic after Saturday's Scottish Cup final against Dundee United. He's standing down to look after his wife, who's ill. O'Neill's won the SPL title three times in five years. Gordon Strachan takes over. Tim Henman has been knocked out in the second round of the French Open, beaten by Lewis Orner. The seventh seed was unable to repeat his achievements of last season when he reached the semi final. And this summer of Test cricket could be Graham Thorpe's last for England. He's told the selectors he's off to play for the Australian stateside New South Wales in the winter. So this uh, could be his final international summer. That's it for the moment. Uh, an update on the Champions League final at the top of the hour. Charlie, thanks very much indeed. We'll speak to you later, no doubt. Now, to those with sensitive ears, it's the most annoying tune ever, but it obviously doesn't drive everyone to distraction. Yes, the crazy frog ringtone, believe it or not, is on course to leap to the top of the single charts this weekend. God, I hate it. It's so annoying. It can be heard screaming out of teenagers' pockets in 17 different countries. But now it's even harder to escape. The crazy frog ringtone and screensaver has spawned an empire. It's been blended with the Beverly Hills cop theme and released as a single. It sold 60,000 copies since Monday, is outselling Coldplay and certain to be number one. But where did the frog spring from? In 1997, in rural Sweden, where there's presumably little else to do, Daniel Malmedal amused friends by imitating the sound of a friend's scooter. We had a party, uh, and I had a computer, and they said, like, hey, record it and do something with it, you know? And I just record it, and, and we put it on repeat, <laughs> and people were laughing and had tears and everything. So, and while, when it ended up in a computer, um, there it spread into the internet and everything, and there it is. A computer animator also from Sweden heard the noise on the net and gave it amphibian form. We spoke to him on the phone. I think it might have um, gained a little bit more attention than, than it deserves probably because it was never intended to, to be this kind of thing. <laughs> They both sold their creation to a German ringtones company. It's generated over £40 million in revenue. The market for mobile phone extras like ringtones, logos and screensavers is worth £400 million in the UK a year, a large slice of the global business which has an annual turnover of £2 billion. As the number of mobile phone users has multiplied, so have the opportunities to sell images and sounds using viral marketing or word of mouth. Most laptop entrepreneurs aren't much older than their customers. You know, many of the, uh, of the real leaps that we've seen both in the internet, on mobile, but also interactive TV have been done out of people's garages. And I think uh, that's the, one of the most exciting parts of this industry. And, uh, and for the mobile phone operators, I think they're only too happy to have some really interesting uh, product to sell to the users. So where one frog has jumped, other cartoon creatures will follow, crowding the ad breaks on music channels. Expect the ringtone menagerie to dominate the charts, as well as the handset. 
Robert Nisbet, Sky News. Look, 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 I'm really sorry. That area of low pressure should have brought rain. The wind must have changed. Thompson.co.uk for City Breaks. Hello there. Well, many parts of Europe had a fine day with plenty of sunshine and it was very warm too. This is the latest satellite picture then showing all this sunshine that we had today. Although I think tomorrow is going to be just as good as today. So plenty more sunshine and feeling warm too all the way through many parts of Europe. Just the odd shower around northern parts of Portugal there. For us, though, well, that seems a world away for some of us because we've seen some very heavy rain. It's gradually working its way towards the southeast, fading out a little bit as it does so. So by first thing tomorrow, it's lying across northern parts of England through Wales and down towards the southwest. For Scotland and Ireland, though, things here are eventually beginning to dry up. And it won't feel too bad either, first thing. Temperatures no lower than 8 or 9 degrees, although there will be a bit of a breeze. At least it should be a bright start and it should be a fairly sunny day. Just one or two showers to watch out for, particularly for western parts parts of Scotland but also one or two just sneaking into the northern parts of Ireland. Now this area of rain here is going to continue its journey towards the southeast but never quite reaching the far southeast corner. So here it will be very humid again and if the sun does begin to break through the clouds you may see those temperatures again up to 23 degrees. That's 73 Fahrenheit. So a very warm day again for the far southeast corner. Now over the next few days things are going to stay very unsettled. It's thanks to a low pressure that's gradually going to work its way across Britain and Ireland on Friday and Saturday. It's got a lot of wet weather associated with it. So on Friday, lots of heavy rain, pretty strong winds too. That's working its way up from the south. Still with us on Saturday, although it should have moved away by Sunday and hopefully for most of us, a bright day. You're watching Sky News in our next hour. Viewers in Ireland can watch Sky News Ireland and after the break, Sky News at 10. And tonight they're playing extra time in an extraordinary Champions League final. We are live with the fans in Liverpool. No evidence from Michael Jackson, but the defence is over and the trial only has days left. And freedom for the man who served 25 years for a crime he didn't commit. C90, because life happens all at once. Yeah. We won't be a second. Should we? Nah, more than give you a car insurance quote in a couple of minutes. It's dead easy. Lucky. Uh, nice car, Tom. Yeah. Hey, look, I've got my quote. That's lucky. And it says I could save even more if I buy online. That's more than lucky. Save more on car insurance when you buy online at morethan.com. I'd been noticing that my gums were bleeding. I asked my dentist about it. He said the gums were bleeding because of a bacteria buildup. He suggested I use a toothpaste that fights the problem. I tried Colgate Total. Well, soon I felt my gums got better and stronger. I could really feel a difference. It was like a whole new start. It was great. Not only is Colgate Total clinically proven to reduce gum disease by up to 88%, it also offers 12-hour protection against tooth and gum problems. Colgate Total. Complete 12-hour protection. It's my choice. Ask your dentist. Your favourite stars are out to play. Buy two Disney DVDs and save an incredible £10. Showtime. <laughs> Including The Incredibles, the Bambi Special Edition. And Alice in Wonderland. Well, lead him, lead him, lead. Disney's incredible buy two, save ten pounds offer. See if you can tell the difference between a call with BT. It's over. And the same call with Telly Two. I said it's over. The only difference is the price. BT 5.5p for a call of up to an hour during evenings and weekends. Telly Two only 4p. Call 0800 027 8080. Telly Two. Why pay more? Yeah, I'm all right. See you in 15 minutes. Go, go, go. A fast relief from allergies, call on Benadryl. It's the only allergy capsule that starts working in just 15 minutes. Benadryl. When we say it's fast, we mean it's fast. All clear. 
This could be what you're looking for. Sky. Movies. Yes. Two best. Place. In the world. Four. Movies. Movies. Movies! With more. 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 Film. Then I have had lovers. Whoa. From Hot House to Love. Faster. My genre's thriller. Whatever. It is that blows your mind. Rocks. Your world. We got it. Everything. Hundreds of movies to match your mood. Sky Movies. Tonight on Sky News at 10, Liverpool stage a stunning comeback in the Champions League final. The Reds keep their dream alive by forcing AC Milan into extra time. Celebrating Liverpool fans see their team fight back from 3-0 down at half-time. We will have the latest live. Blair defends ID cards, but they could cost £100 each. The defence rests its case in the Jackson trial, but have they done enough to get him off? And bringing up millions of pounds in sales, the ringtone now soaring up the singles charts. Sky News with Alan King and Paula Middlehurst. Very good evening and welcome to Sky News at 10. It's been a football match like no other and it's not over yet. Indeed, the Champions League final between Liverpool and AC Milan really has been a game of two halves. The first half was nothing short of disastrous for the Merseysiders. Milan quickly went 3-0 up. But Liverpool emerged from the tunnel in blistering form for the second half. They scored three goals in just 14 minutes. They are now into extra time. Well, they just finished the first half of extra time, actually, and uh, our sports presenter, Charlie Thomas, uh, is here with us. This is the stuff that football history is made of. It's uh, absolutely unprecedented, extraordinary stuff, Paula. At half-time, Liverpool were down and out. 3-0 down in a Champions League final. You just don't come back from that. But they did. Uh, Steven Gerrard was the man who got... Now to Sky's Paul Harrison, who's uh, been watching that match with Liverpool fans at a pub on Merseyside. And uh, when we first crossed to you, Paul, in the first half, uh, despondency uh, among the fans behind you, some of them kissing their crucifixes, praying. Now they're singing and they're a scenes of jubilation where you are. Yeah, absolutely. These guys are going to be singing all the way to the end. They're right behind Liverpool. They saw the first half go completely against them. It was disastrous for them. Some were even leaving the pub and going home. They thought there's no way that we can pull back from 3-0 down. They then saw those smiles written across their faces at the end of full time, 3 all. Uh, but really, the extra time has gone uh, pretty much even Steven so far. What these fans do not want to see, though, they do not want to go to penalties. You know, it's been an amazing tournament for Liverpool. They've been pretty uh, much ruled out of many of their games so far as the underdog. But they've come this far. These fans are desperate for them to win. Uh, but they don't want penalties. But they think that Liverpool now, they're the ones taking it to Milan. And they're going to make it all the way. Paul Harrison for the moment, thanks very much. They're into the 20th minute of extra time at the moment. We'll obviously keep you posted on developments in that game and bring you the final score just as soon as we have it. The game's still very lively, as you can see. A man who spent a quarter of a century in prison for a crime he did not commit has had his conviction quashed. Paul Blackburn was wrongly jailed for the attempted murder of a nine-year-old boy. His case has been described as one of the worst miscarriages of justice in British legal history. But he's always insisted the confession he made to police as a child was extracted under duress. The judges at the appeal court were highly critical of the police and their investigation. They said such a lengthy questioning of a 15-year-old boy without a parent or a guardian gave them real cause for concern. And without the confession, the evidence against Paul Blackburn was circumstantial and of limited weight. His legal team argued the confession was fabricated. The appeal court judges agreed, saying there was now evidence of significant police involvement in its wording. Without the confession, there was no case. The Crown wouldn't have gone ahead back in 78 without that confession. Birthday. He could have got out a lot earlier if he'd conceded, made admissions to things that he had never done. 
but his strength of character took him all the way through the prison system. After more than two decades in jail, Paul Blackburn has finally cleared his name. But in doing so, he's lost his childhood and much of his adult life. Alex Rossi, Sky News at the High Court. ID cards could be compulsory within a few years and they could cost almost £100 apiece. Today the government said it would plough on with its plans and reveal more details. They're likely to be phased in from 2007 to 2008 when those applying for passports will also have to get an ID card. But the cards could be made compulsory from as early as 2010. So what will it cost the taxpayer? Well, the Home Office won't put a figure on the cost of setting up the scheme. It says that is too commercially sensitive. But it has been revealed today that the entire scheme would cost £584 million to run every year. And that breaks down to £93 per card, more than the £88 predicted in November, although it has not yet been decided how much people will actually have to pay to get one. Just faces in a crowd today, but soon somewhere in a government building will be held precise records of your facial features, fingerprints and even a digital scan of your eyes. This so-called biometric data will be matched on compulsory identity cards, each costing £93 and combined with a passport. This is an important moment where we decide that we will legislate so that we can enable identity cards to be taken forward. Trials involving 10,000 volunteers have already been carried out. There have been hitches with the technology, and some critics fear that today heralds a new Big Brother society. Well, I've got nothing to hide against people I trust, but I've everything to hide against people I don't trust, and I'm not so sure, and I think a lot of people have misgivings about whether they can trust the government. Each card will carry personal information such as name, date of birth, address and nationality. A microchip will store the biometric data, including fingerprints, face and iris scans. All the details held on the cards will be stored on a massive computer database, the National Identity Register, so that the cards can be cross-checked. Thousands of forged passports and visas are checked by this office every month. For instance, this Greek passport, it says 1960, but the experts here can run some very, very sophisticated checks and putting it under infrared light, it becomes clear that the six has been altered from a five. Now what the government claims is that if we have ID cards, a lot of this work will prove unnecessary. But tonight, security specialists claimed that ID cards would never be the entire answer. I could take two of these cards. I have your press card, I have your credit card. Give me an afternoon, 50 pounds, and a DIY center, and I could duplicate your identity and be walking through the gates to Downing Street this afternoon. And the annual cost to the taxpayer for operating ID cards, 584 million pounds. Tim Friend, Sky News. A murder hunt has begun after the body of a 17-year-old girl was found in wasteland near home. Jeshma Retata disappeared last week, just days before her 18th birthday. She was about to sit her A-levels and be described as a talented actress and singer. Police are appealing for anyone with information to come forward. The footballer Rio Ferdinand has been banned from driving after he was caught overtaking a police car at 106 miles an hour. He was taken off the roads for 28 days and fined £1,500. It's the 26-year-old England defender's third driving ban. The film producer Ishmael Merchant has died at the age of 68. As part of the Merchant Ivory Partnership, he made films such as A Room with a View, Remains of the Day and Howard's End. He died in a London hospital this afternoon after suffering stomach problems over the past year. Room with a View, one of the great films of all time. I've just come back from Florence and I thought of it again and again. Howard's End, wonderful. Uh, the Bostonians I loved, an American film he did. You know, they made an enormous contribution. It's strange that these people came from the Indian continent and really popularised some of the loveliest spots of Europe and England. 
The Michael Jackson trial has heard from its final witness. Actor Chris Tucker told the court he'd warned Jackson about his accusers' wheedling and cunning ways. The singer's defence team have now wrapped up their case. There could be a verdict as soon as next week. The defence rests, but Michael Jackson can't. His face seems full of bewilderment and pain. His shuffle into court seems more ponderous than ever. His wave to fans practised but tired. Comedian Chris Tucker's evidence brought Jackson's defence to a close. His testimony added little that was new, but it succeeded in its clear intention of heaping more suspicion on the Arviso family and Mother Janet in particular. He told the jury she, Janet, was frantically saying I was their brother. She loved me and all this stuff. I was getting a little nervous because my whole thing was to help the kid, Gavin, not to get attached to the family. Tucker's willingness to recall detail for the defence, however, was matched only by his forgetfulness before prosecutors. He is more stubborn. He is not willing to give any more information than he has really asked for, unless it's something he seems to think is going to help the defence. That's the only time he's volunteering information. Michael Jackson must now endure perhaps a further week of witness testimony from prosecution and defence, then closing speeches before the jury finally retires to consider its verdict on the 10 charges against him. He faces 20 years in prison. Prosecutor Tom Snedden is keen to get back on the offensive after days of attacks on the Arviso family. He's called Hazer Salas, who worked at Neverland, to pour scorn on Jackson's claim that he never drinks. Salas says he saw Jackson drunk in the presence of his own children at least three times. He told the court, to me, it was not safe for the kids to be around him. Thomas Mesereau's dramatic words, the defense rests, have only served to heighten the tension and anxiety for Jackson. He said before this trial he wanted his day in court, He's had it now without uttering a word in his own defence. And soon a jury of 12 will decide his future. Ian Doverston, Sky News, Santa Maria. Well, we're using actors to recreate the vital moments of the Michael Jackson trial throughout our coverage on Sky News. You can see a special half-hour programme featuring the day's evidence at 9.30 and 2.30. That's Tuesday to Saturday, and that's repeated throughout the day on Sky News Active. It was billed as David versus Goliath, a young rising star of the Tory party taking on Britain's longest serving Chancellor of modern times. But George Osborne's battle with Gordon Brown wasn't the only heavyweight Commons clash. As MPs got back to business today, Sky's going to Glaser was ringside. It was a day which promised not one but two headline bouts in the Commons and ringside seats were hard to find. Topping the bill, the latest round of verbal sparring between Tony Blair and Michael Howard. Round one. But the first Prime Minister's questions of the new Parliament didn't live up to its billing. Like two exhausted fighters in the 15th round, the two men traded blows without ever really connecting. Michael Howard wanted to know if the Home Secretary wants young offenders to wear uniforms. But the Home Secretary promptly backed her up, saying that putting offenders in orange uniforms is not only a goer, it's happening now in many parts of the country. So what's the policy? Is it a goer or not? There are already. You're the goer, shouted Labour MPs, but since Tony Blair has also announced that he's going, he didn't join in. That would be most unkind. Uh... Next up, in the red corner, heavyweight champion of the economy, Gordon Brown, and in the blue corner, the young pretender still fighting at lightweight, 34-year-old George Osborne. Round two. The new shadow chancellor looked and sounded nervous and very young. Now, I know he sees himself as prime minister in waiting. I only hope that he proves better... <laughs> I only hope he proves better at being Prime Minister than he has been at waiting. <laughs> oh dear, he'll need some better jokes than that if he's going to survive with this audience. But things did get better and he ended with a flourish. Mr Deputy Speaker, it looks increasingly like this 20th century Chancellor is running out of answers to the challenges of the 21st century. But Gordon Brown was clearly enjoying himself. Mr Deputy Speaker, let me start by saying 
what a pleasure it is to welcome the new Shadow Ch Secretary Chancellor. And I look forward to answering every point that he made during the course of my remarks. It, it's always a pleasure to welcome a new Shadow Chancellor. In fact, since uh, 1997, I've had the pleasure of welcoming seven new Shadow Chancellors. All four men will be back in the ring soon enough. George Osborne doesn't yet match the skill, power and strength of the other three. George Osborne is well aware of the limitations of his youth. He's already said he's not going to stand for the Conservative Party leadership this time around. But he's going to have to really work very hard on his technique if he's going to rise up and match the man facing him across the dispatch box, Gordon Brown. Glenna Glaser, Sky News, Westminster. It's been an extraordinary night in football. For the latest on the Champions League final in Istanbul, Charlie Thomas is with us. They've just finished extra time. Charlie, what now? Well, let's just do up to update you. They were Liverpool 3-0 down at half-time. They fought back to 3 all, and it stayed that way for the remainder of the match. As Paula says, it was uh, extra time, and that finished 3 all. So it's now penalties, drama right to the end. Dudek making an incredible double save from Andrei Shevchenko. And Liverpool had a free kick with the very last kick of the game. Didn't work out. Paul Harrison's been watching with a lot of Liverpool fans on Merseyside. And what's the mood there now? We got it. Well, they're still singing. They'll be by hand now for the next 20 or so minutes while these penalties are sorted out. I was speaking to some of the fans earlier on. This is really not what they wanted. They really wanted to win the game outright, even if it was an extra time. Penalties is not what they wanted at all. Uh, Steve uh, is with me. You've been all the way through this game. You've been the highs and the lows. It's been an amazing game, isn't it? It's been emotional, to say the least. But, um, you know, even with the second half time, that we will be on penalties. No one. No, it's probably the greatest comeback ever. It's like the greatest escape, isn't it? The greatest comeback ever. Anyone ever done in the Champions League. I mean, all no disrespect, both teams. This game will be. You know, it's going to be so long, TBT. The greatest ever. The greatest cup final ever. And respect both teams, but it's a lottery. That's what we can do it. What happened in about 27 minutes of extra time? There was very, very nearly a goal, but a great save, wasn't it? Jersey, you know, he, you know he's had the kick of the year and that. But he made a great save, and then the second one was that's just instinct. That's just pure instinct, and that's a world class save. And you never know, that might go out to win him. It's been a, not a great season for you domestically, but in Europe you've done fantastically. Would it, it would be a catastrophe if you didn't win now. I know, yeah, I mean, it's been frustration in the Premier League. Now we haven't um, no, done as well as we should be doing. Beating great teams like Chelsea, Juventus, you know, buying Leverkusen. And it, it is really frustrating, but, you know, let's hope we can win this and put ourselves back on the pinnacle where we should be. It's not a European football team, you know, the fans you've been all here. Support all across the city, across the country. It's been fantastic. Let's hope we can just give us something else now. Someone else to cheer about and a few more drinks. That'll be the best thing. Get a, get, get a quick drink in, Steve. You've got a bit more to go yet. Thanks very much indeed for joining me. Well, uh, Steve's pretty much echoing it exactly how it is for everybody here. They've lived through the highs and the lows. Their eyes are going to be, I believe me, glued to these television screens. They'll be shouting right until the last penalty is kicked. They want to win. Paul, thanks very much. And uh, now it's down to the uh, awful... Uh, Penalty shootouts, the lottery of penalty shootouts. And of course, teams practice this for precisely these. It's ironic to say that, but he has um, pulled off some terrific saves. Uh, but in the end, really, it's uh, down to who holds their nerve best. Um, we hear that AC Milan have been practicing their penalties. Hope that's not an omen. They are so experienced, the AC Milan team. They've uh, all been there before. You know, they've all won World Cups, they've uh, won European Championships. This Liverpool side is uh, fairly inexperienced and this is a huge occasion for them. So really, you, uh, your heart goes out to them. But even experienced players like we saw with Paul Scholes from Man United last weekend against Arsenal can get it wrong. Too true, absolutely right. And there's some, it doesn't matter how experienced you are, uh, you're still going to have those nerves when you have to step up 
and it uh, does look as if AC Milan will be taking the first penalty of the evening. It's uh, at the end where all six goals have been scored so far. That's the uh, south end of the uh, stadium, the Ataturk Stadium in Istanbul. Now this is the state, well these uh, Liverpool fans we're watching here are um, looking pretty relaxed and upbeat I have to say. It's Serginho who's uh, going to take the uh, first spot kick for the Italians. He's uh, come on as a substitute and uh, it's his responsibility to slot it past Dudek, who's doing his best to put him off, and he's put it wide. AC Milan have put their first spot kick wide, and that's why celebrations are going on in that Liverpool bar. Serginho blasting it well over the top and wide of the goal in a shot uh, rather reminiscent of uh, Chris Waddle all those years ago if you can remember that far back and now advantage Liverpool if they can slot this one away it's Dietmar Haman who's uh, been uh, given the responsibility of uh, taking the first kick for Liverpool by Rafael Benitez likewise a substitute he came on early in the first half he's done a little uh, jink and a step and he's put it in Liverpool go 1-0 up and I can tell you Dida the Brazilian keeper guessed the right way went to his right but it was a well taken spot kick and he slotted it into the right hand of uh, Dida's goal it was a tactic there wasn't it Charlie he kind of slowed up his kick and, and put it Dida right off his stroke there was a time when you weren't allowed to do that but uh, these days you can and uh, he certainly uh, took it with uh, yep. some aplomb there, didn't he? And uh, so it's 1-0 after the first yep. set of spot kicks to Liverpool. And uh, we're going to stay with this yeah, okay. right the way through. Now AC Milan with uh, Palo coming up to, uh, to go. And Dudek saved it! Dudek has guessed right and saved it. So that's two penalties for AC Milan and two gone begging. Now this time it was Dudek who once again uh, was doing all kinds of moving around in his, in his goal line and it came off his line in fact but uh, wasn't actually spotted and uh, so he's kept out the spot kick there from AC Milan so they've uh, had to, missed to. Now if Gibril Sisse can put this one ahead uh, through rather then uh, Liverpool really will be in the box seats. Five penalties each, remember. And uh, if it's level after that, then it's at sudden death. All the Liverpool play players with their arms around each other's shoulders. Here goes uh, Gibriel Sisse now. And he's put it home. Liverpool 2-0 up. Sisse celebrates. Rafael Benitez, the man manager, looking absolutely emotionless on the touchline. Not so the Liverpool supporters. All over the world they're watching this. I'll not just what, in Liverpool. I hope there's no breaking news for Sky News to deal with tonight because our <laughs> newsroom's pretty uh, similar to that pub it's down there Liverpool in Liverpool. 2-0 on penalties, not three as you can see on your score sheet there. 2-0. Now then, three to go for each team. And uh, AC Milan now have scored their first penalty it's 2-1 now to AC Milan with their third spot kick and so they do have a glimmer of hope now the Italians but as you can see these Liverpool supporters very much believe the uh, the force is with them now and uh, Dida the Brazilian goalkeeper goes to get the ball Liverpool 1-0, one, uh, one goal ahead and uh, with the possibility now of going 3-1 uh, ahead it's John Arna Risa with the responsibility to uh, re-establish this two goal cushion settles himself relatively long run and it's saved this time it was a pretty good spot kick he pushed it uh, 
right to uh, the uh, extreme right of Dida but uh, Dida got across one-handed and saved and uh, so that's the first Liverpool penalty missed or saved but they still do have that one goal cushion it's 2-1 with two to go now then who is going to be next for AC Milan two goals to go for each side and uh, remember this would be Liverpool's first European Cup in 21 years it's Kaka the Brazilian to take the fourth spot kick and uh, he scored I can tell you for AC Milan that's why it's gone quiet in uh, that Liverpool bar there hands across faces and uh, Dudek I tell you is uh, giving it the full treatment in his goal he's uh, going left to right right to left to try and put them off but uh, that time it was to no avail it's 2-2 but uh, AC Milan only have one left now it's uh, Vladimir Smitser I think who's going to take the uh, fourth penalty for Liverpool he has to get this to keep alive their advantage here goes Smitser now and takes it beautifully wait for the cry there it is these Liverpool supporters uh, getting a slight delayed coverage here we're getting ours here in the studio just a few seconds ahead of them so with four penalties down one to go if this is saved by Dudek or it's missed Liverpool are European champions it could all be decided by this very next kick Dudek has the ball in his hands he passes it to Shevchenko who remember scored the winning penalty for AC Milan in the European Championship final two years ago here he goes and Dudek has saved it Liverpool are champions of Europe they've won it 3-2 on the penalty shootout it was an awful penalty by Shevchenko Andrei Shevchenko the great striker for AC Milan he tried to place it in the center of the goal and Dudek managed to keep it out so what drama what irony Shevchenko who won the European Cup for AC Milan two years ago is now responsible for their demise in the final this time and Liverpool have added a fifth trophy to the four they won in their glory years it's been 21 long years and who would have believed it back at the beginning of this season they had to go through the qualifying route to even get to the the, uh, uh, the group stage they managed to get through that no one ever could have believed that they would have uh, got that far they then went through the uh, knockout stage knocking out teams like Bayer Lever and now have won it 3-2 on penalties let's go back now to uh, Paul Harrison who's with those ecstatic Liverpool supporters if you can hear me Paul it's back to you as you would imagine, you cannot even bear to be here. It is unbelievably noisy. People are unbelievably happy. They can barely believe it. After the first half when they were 3-0 down, one fan said to me, you know, I believe in the Reds. The Red boys will get back, will pull back. And they did. They pulled back to 3 all at the end of normal time. A little bit of a hiatus in the extra time, pretty evenly matched but the Red Revival, what a, what a great game, started by Gerard in the second half, then Spitzer, then Lonza. This season they finished yeah. fifth, but uh, to have a tournament which is not defended by the champions, surely some uh, rethinking has got to be done there, but uh, let's not think about that at the moment. Liverpool are champions of Europe, they've beaten AC Milan, the veterans of Italy 3-2 on penalties after it finished 3-all after extra time.
Well, scenes of jubilation in Liverpool tonight as they win on penalties. They're the new European champions. Welcome back to our viewers from Ireland. Sky News viewers in Ireland just joining us as uh, we see these scenes live in Liverpool tonight. Uh, they've won on penalties. They're the new European champions in the final against AC Milan in Istanbul tonight. Extraordinary scenes, uh, Charlie, tonight in Istanbul. 